Arda will support up to 75% of your travel for up to 30 days of independent research over the summer. It could be abroad, uh, it could be in the United States. We actually have um, um, a US-based research project this summer. So um, start thinking about it. Um, we have um, the school's YouTube page. We have videos of previous Arda winners. So if you want to get a sense of what previous uh, projects have been, please visit there. But um, we, we have gotten a pretty good crop of applicants each year. And then everyone, the school leadership sits, sits down at the end of January and we'll, we'll decide who they're going to fund for next year. Um, and we try to let people know by the first part of February so you can start making plans for your summer travel. OK? Hello. So uh, the ARTA program is made possible by a bequest from a former faculty member who was here who chose to remain anonymous. Uh, and he left a, be left a bequest to the Columbus Foundation um, to support independent travel. So he was really, I'm, a, I'm actually one of the few people left who knew him. He was really intent on getting the students to think for themselves and act independently, which is why it's a, um, it's a independent research grant. So it's not to be used to go on one of the uh, uh, schools uh, travel programs, but he really wanted people to sit down think about what they'd like to learn from traveling experiences because he had spent a lot of his time uh, traveling and thought that it was uh, part, uh, the best part of his education. So uh, anyway, um, I'd like to thank the Columbus Foundation. Alicia Zembrook is here uh, representing the foundation and they manage the fund and uh, uh, help us do this. Um, so since 2008, um, with the, the program has supported more than uh, uh, three dozen students uh, and they've traveled all over the world. So Africa, South America, Asia, throughout the United States uh, and uh, Europe. Um, so uh, I don't think anybody's gone to Australia. So there's an opportunity for you. Um, uh, anyway, so uh, uh, listen to the presentations today, see the great experiences that the students have had, and then uh, talk it up among your, uh, your colleagues. So uh, to give the students more time, I'm going to be really quick. First up is going to be Sa uh, Sandy Seachang, uh, and she's going to talk about the Syrian refugees in uh, Berlin. And then we're going to have Katie Lau and Andrew Miller who are going to talk about the garden in the city uh, from their study in, in uh, Great Britain. And then uh, Jonathan Sack Stacker, uh, who's going to talk about western watersheds, but primarily in, in southwestern the United States. So thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Sandy C. Chang. I'm currently a fourth year in city and regional planning. Um, so being a city and regional planning student has really allowed me to redefine what helping people really means for the better. And I just want to say the environment of Knowlton has really exposed me to really amazing people and given me room to grow as a person. And I just know when I've been discouraged and grown weary and questioned whether justice and mercy in this world was even worth pursuing, the community here at Knowlton has really helped me to not lose sight of that bigger picture. And I'd like to thank Arda and the Office of International Affairs for providing me an opportunity to travel and to engage in the bigger picture. So currently in America, we are not allowing Syrian refugees into our borders. And I found that this is a really great opportunity for me to go somewhere different and to a city that was integrating refugees into its city fabric. And I was able to take an excursion to Berlin to learn more about where refugees are being housed and what potential solutions could the United States um, apply, given our context today. So the methods I used were engaging in conversations with locals there, volunteering at the local refugee centers, and attending workshops at the Technical University of Berlin. And through interviews and dialogues, I was able to just kind of hear about the passion that the people of Berlin have for refugees. They love soccer and they love their own history and culture, but 
They also had such love for refugees, people who weren't even from their country. So it was really a great environment to be in. And throughout the city, there was a lot of um, like welcome refugee signs and graffiti art that promoted, um, I don't know, a camaraderie in the environment. And so through the city, um, I was able to volunteer at refugee centers. And the way I did this was joining Facebook groups and using social media. <clears throat> So many of the refugee centers I found myself at were existing rec centers, retrofitted airports, and shipping containers. And through conversation, I learned that the refugees found housing by registering at a police station, and they would get redirected to one of the 16 federal states. And they were allowed to stay at a refugee center for three months. And then after that, they would have to move to another location for three months. Um, and the intent of this was the local governments wanted refugees to not be isolated at refugee centers. They really wanted them to break into the local housing market after three months. So this is one of my favorite refugee centers I volunteered at. I called it the balloon because it's kind of airy in there and most of the people were not from Syria. Like a lot of them came from the Middle East but I've met people from Kenya even, so I feel like these centers draw all sorts of refugees in. Ooh. Sorry. Um, the organization I partnered with at this refugee center was called Serve the City. It's a local nonprofit, and basically what I did was helped um, refugees kind of learn public transportation um, and build trust with them. And so I would ask them how they went about finding housing. And they told me the government was really helpful, but they actually just trusted their friends and their family members. And I was really amazed because I went in thinking they were going to use apps and everything, but they didn't. A lot of them left their home countries because of the information that their families and friends had shared with them. So word of mouth was the way they did things. So. After many interviews, um, I went to the Technical University of Berlin, and I realized you know, there was not one solution for this really complicated situation and crisis. And I went to a studio where architecture students and city planning students were kind of in the same boat as me. We're like trying to figure out what is the best solution. And they concluded that a long-term solution would be the most efficient. And they designed something called the Kitchen Hub which is a place where refugees and non-refugees can interact and cook and eat and work together and kind of share a vision for what the refugees wanted in their housing environment. Because I feel like when we think about housing, it's kind of narrow. And the people at the, this university saw it as interlacing forms of living together and designing and collaborating, collaborating with existing volunteer organizations. So I got to visit it actually, and I felt like it was a really welcoming environment. It was a place of coexistence and mutual exchange. And it was a really good starting point. It had a really good turnout. So the trip Arda had provided for me really allowed me to understand further what it means to help people. Um, a distinct memory I have was when I volunteered at a refugee center in Spandau, and I learned how traumatizing it can be for re like refugees to interact with volunteers, because we're constantly coming in and out of their lives, and we're not really helping them when we're just leaving all of the time. And I think as an American, I have this like intrinsic need to feel needed, and I just wanted to help them. Um, but at this refugee center, they kind of shared with me like, we don't need you to help us. We don't need your wisdom or your housing expertise. We just want you to listen to us and to be with us. Um, and that really resonated with me. And I think as planners, we need to realize the need for consistency and preservation of human dignity. Like, refugees are very capable people. And they shared with me they just wanted to play board games with Germans and learn the language in a casual setting and they wanted to cook alongside other cultures and share their own culture. They wanted to contribute. 
So a potential solution America, I think, can implement is to invest in spaces like community uh, public centers, libraries, and spaces with a predominantly welcoming, welcoming social climate for engagement. I think we can't assume interactions will just happen. As a planner, I see now how cities need to carve out intentional space for um, refugees to be integrated in. We have to move beyond the old rhetoric of just believing that things will happen. And it was moving for me to like go there and to learn how my Syrian refugee friends appreciated a space where they could be free. Freedom is a really powerful theme in Germany. And I see that here in America too. Freedom means a lot to us. So I never imagined that I would be capable of traveling by myself as a female and as someone who's never left the country until this year. But it was really a gift that was given to me and I feel like I've really gained a lot of confidence to not be bound by fear. And Germany made me question if I really saw people without fear. Years ago, I heard a news report that said we made our first impressions of people in three seconds. And so, of course, I saw refugees on my friend's Facebook posts and in the news, but spending time in Berlin helped me to look again. And I was invited to get past my first impression and to practice being in their presence. And there was more to them that met the eye, and I was able to pay attention to their unsold, unsold stories and become more aware of my own blindness. And it was really cool for me to see how the city has potential to welcome people and I didn't recognize our own faults. And I really loved every moment in Berlin, not because it was super hip or well organized, but I think cities are as wonderful as the people who live in them. And I kept running into people who just truly cared about others. And they believe that you couldn't help who your neighbor was. It didn't matter if the neighbor like lived across the street from you or around the world. They just saw people as humans and how we're all interconnected. And so I just saw Germans noticing people and really giving like refugees the gift of mattering. And so I think today I'm realizing practicing the presence of people doesn't mean I sit around talking about how educators, government, social workers, and aid agencies can fix the issues. Instead, Germany has taught me how our country needs to open up our eyes to see what's going on right in front of us and what we can do to kind of shift the conversation. Instead of like, oh, there's so many refugees here and feeling overwhelmed, we can shift the conversation. Because when I was volunteering and interviewing people, everyone was like in a lot of pain and struggling with anxiety. And it's not that I can solve their anxiety, but I can listen to them and look for the real story that is behind their fears. And even though I can't see it all, I know I can keep from going blind by engaging in the city so that we can be networked together. So to end, I wanted to share with you a second of each day in Berlin and how I got past my first impressions. That's all. My name's Katie Lau, and I graduated from the architecture program here in the spring. I'm Andrew Miller, and I also graduated in the spring. So for our ARDA project, we spent about a month in the United Kingdom looking at different cities and gardens. Um, we started in London, and we rented a car, so we were able to make stops in most major cities as well as national parks and small towns along the way. So our thesis, our overall argument for our ARDA was um, the idea that the English city and gardens are influential generators of one another. And throughout this project, we were seeking to analyze useful relationships in organization and formal themes between the two. Um, our exploration of the connections between English gardens and cities revealed to us how English gardens have impacted the design of English cities in parks, streets, public spaces, new towns, and placement of monuments. Landscape architects established strategies of English garden design that were more concerned with experience of place than overall order. 
These motifs focus on the path, the view, and the individual person's relationship to their environment. Urban planners went on to borrow from the theory of English garden design and landscape architecture and city planning intertwined to create distinct experiential qualities that resonate across the British built environment and play a major role in efforts like post-war housing solutions. Uh, the ideas that were established in English garden design still impact modern day cities. Uh, to uh, sort of organize everything, we created this uh, framework of motifs and we sort of, for the presentation, we're going to uh, describe them and then give a specific examples of them. While each work uh, embodies multiple motifs, we're just going to simplify it for, yeah, good. So our first idea is the idea of the picturesque and seeing the picturesque movement as a crystallization of um, natural conditions in the medieval urban in the medieval English landscape and urbanisms. Um, the picturesque garden is kind of an exaggerated collection of these type of moments. Uh, at Milton Abbas, you see Capability Brown taking an early example um, of the picturesque, where he is looking at low architecture, the sort of natural architecture of England, and sort of bringing it as an inspiration for a, a high architecture. And uh, Corf Castle, which is uh, one of the first castles built after the Norman invasion in 1066, uh, we see the uh, functional space that has now decayed and is used as an example of like the picturesque ruin in the landscape. So next, the idea of procession is the idea of path through um, a garden or city. In a garden, the path kind of drives the narrative argument and positions views and reveals information. And in a city, um, a path creates hierarchy mm -hmm. and displays monuments and landmarks and creates identity through sequence. So we're looking at circulation in urban space as much a design element and as a means of um, making experiencing a place possible. Uh, at Hester Combe Garden, we see this in the way that as you move through the garden, your relationship to the landscape around it changes. As you enter, you're sort of in a more pastoral sense. There's cows that live five feet from the garden. Uh, the view off in the distance sort of shows mountains in the wilds, and then the garden is sort of the interface between the two. And as you move through, views are frames that show you each thing and hide the other or both at the same time. At Stourhead, it's done in a more allegorical manner where uh, you see a view from across the way, like this picture of the uh, Temple of Apollo, and it's later revealed to you, and they're used to tell a story as you move through the garden. Um, sort of a, it's a reference to uh, the Aeneid by Virgil. And here's a view of a incredibly long couple mile axis at Serencester. Uh, in the urban environment, we see this at uh, Wellwyn in the sort of garden cities that are done uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, so as you enter Wellwyn on the road, you're in a forest with really low density housing. And as you crest a hill, you enter, uh, see it on the bottom left, through that crescent. And so you go over a bridge and the city opens up to you and you're in like the main garden of the city, sort of nailing home the uh, garden idea. The English view of the relationship between civilization and nature affects design decisions in gardens, acting as a cultural undercurrent that affects um, centuries of design work. Um, as visitors proceed through English gardens, their relationship to the environment around them evolves. At Eiford Manor, we see this in the way that you start in the Italianate garden, the top right picture, which is a very manicured and controlled garden. And as you move along the main bar, which you can see in the diagram, the uh, architectural fragments sort of become atomesque and begin to decay into the landscape. And as you move farther and farther, the fragments become more uh, ruined follies, and you start to enter the wood, and there's just piece, like small pieces rather than an architectural whole. At Bedford Park, we see this in the way that you enter the city. You come through the train. It was a railroad, railroad subway in the beginning. Uh, and as you exit the train, you're on Acton Green, which is the main town square. So off to your right, you have like commercial and houses. There's a uh, Voise house here. And then off to the left, you have the main town square. And it sort of uh, really nails home the garden suburb thing. Also, every street ends in a, uh, like, well, at one point, there's a suburb there now. But every street used to end on a farm, which would bring the sort of natural idea closer to each house. <clears throat> So layering is used as a technique to kind of reinforce these philosophical ideas by creating depth, framing views, and obscuring elements to be later revealed. At the Borough Market in Southwark, just across the uh, river from downtown London, uh, there's like temporal layering and also sectional layering. So at the top, the big bar is a railroad track. Below that, you have the uh, streetscape, which is sort of the traditional streetscape. And then below that, sort of carved out, is the borough market, which is sort of an urban uh, world, when once you're inside of it, nothing else really reads to you. It's just a complete microcosm. 
Uh, and then this hill garden, which is a small garden in Hampstead, uh, north of London, but not too far out. Uh, as you enter the garden, the foliage is used as frame to reveal architectural fragments. And then as you move through, the rest of the architecture is revealed to you and you sort of get the whole uh, idea of the garden. Similar to layering false appearances, um, use the technique to reinforce design themes. False appearances idealize form or organization, hide paths or objects, and create decoys. Uh, this initial appearance adds fantasy, surprise, and emphasis to moments where true connections are revealed. Uh, we see this in uh, Bidolf Grange at the Cheshire Cottage, where the outside of it, as you approach, is a small vernacular English hut. And then as soon as you enter, you're in a completely different world. To your right is an Egyptian statue. And if you look to the left, there's the rest of the Egyptian axis. So it's where the exterior and interior conditions are completely different. And it sort of creates a surprise. And it happens a lot in this uh, garden. It's a really good garden. Uh, yeah. The Chinese temple is a separate, different part. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't have a picture of the Egypt part, so I figured I would show you China. <laughs> that part's fun, too. Um, interplay between rooms and pochet is a recurrent theme in the English garden. Collections of garden rooms and paths between them resemble urban compositions comprised of street and square. Uh, Leon Creer does this at Poundbury in two scales. The main squares, which are sort of strung along the main street, uh, work as urban rooms where uh, commercial and sort of like residential above strategies uh, bring the community together. And then also on a smaller scale, behind most of the housing blocks are small courtyards where you can have your kids play, you can park your car, and they sort of bring the neighbors together. Uh, Sissinghurst, which is a 1930s garden by uh, Vita Sackville West, um, has rooms, and the interstice in between them is often used as like a poche, which you can see in the top, you can walk in between those hedges and you're sort of in a long hallway, which is space in between the rooms. And then more ambiguous transitions, like the picture on the bottom right, where you can see the uh, transition between space used in ground condition. Symbolic forms are reappropriated physically and ideologically to contemporary mindsets. Embedded meetings play into design narratives. At uh, St. George's Bloomsbury, uh, you see this in the way that uh, the Campanile and the Greek temple are sort of changed and reappropriated, so they're pulled into different areas. They're both religious symbolism, but they're pulled so that the church is sort of a uh, collage of the two, and the axis, like the main axis of the church, is actually the side axis of a traditional church. Uh, and then we sort of look at this as a whole, this uh, cultural memory. The English garden, a lot of the time, especially in Edwardian times, uh, works as a sort of reminiscent of the cloister. So at Sissinghurst, we see it. Um, but it's often broken up and opened. So uh, the wrapper at Sissinghurst is straightened out. And that gives you a view to the uh, village and the landscape off in the distance. It's sort of bringing the two together, the natural landscape and the cloistered garden. The English garden is comprised of individual moments, views, and experiences that reveal a larger whole, representative of pluralistic ideas about government and land ownership. Rather than being subservient to a central order, English Romanticism allows multiplicity and the emergence of the architectural object. Uh, at Rousham, there's sort of a plurality of option and view. So once you leave the house, you come down this, uh, you follow the river down, and you're sort of in a Greek urban space where it's just loose and there's fragments of pieces around. Uh, and this is sort of indicative of the way the landed gentry would uh, rule England. There was a multiplicity of voice in government, and they each had their power, as opposed to France, where everything bowed to one man. Uh, this also happens at Chiswick, where um, the garden axis, it's sort of Baroque, but all of the monuments that you would expect to be on the axis are pulled to the side. Like, you can see the bridge on the left, or the main house doesn't even sit on the main garden axis. Actually, like a small little side corner does. And it, also the same at Regent's Park, where all the houses are given the same relationship to the garden, and it's non-hierarchical. Romantic and picturesque styles emphasize cubic masses and allow for autonomy of parts. The style's struggle for visual freedom is expressed in the freedom of the object. A complex whole is broken down into differentiated parts, which perform on their own as individual experiences, but relate back to the argument of the larger whole. Uh, Ickworth House, which is a big circle with some arms attached to it, it's pretty cool. Uh, sort of works this way. When you're in the garden, all you see is the dome, and it sort of becomes an object in the landscape. But when you're on the other side, it sort of fits into the big arms. And then when you're inside of it, you get a third idea where you don't actually read any of that at all. It's just a traditional nine square, but with rounded walls. 
And then uh, we see this at Blenheim Palace as well, as well, where they start to pool the uh, sort of Baroque composition into pieces, and the whole house starts to pool apart, and everything gets more defined. So, in conclusion, this was a really great experience for us, and we're thankful to the Knowlton School and the Columbus Foundation. Um, We've gained a contextual framework for navigating this particular architectural history and um, a lot of precedent to draw from in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, you guys doing? Um, I'm Jonathan Staker. I'm a third year Master's of Landscape Architecture student. Um, and I just wanted to, stay, or I guess, first thank uh, Knowlton School and the ARTA, or excuse me, the uh, Columbus Foundation for providing me this opportunity. Um, I'm in the midst of a thesis process, um, and so this presentation um, will come kind of from uh, a broader sense in the fact that this trip was planned as an investigation that would lead into an eventual thesis. So if you are in a position where you're going into your final year uh, having, a, uh, having to do a thesis, this is a great opportunity for you to kind of set it up and to do some uh, field work or site investigation before you do. So with that, um, I'm going to begin. Um, so the origins of this trip lie within my fundamental fascination with the idea of the Western frontier and its future. Uh, the collection of places that compose the idea of West have served as the subject of countless daydreams uh, since I began to read of its landscapes and the chronicles of those who first ex explored this unknown. The words spoken repeatedly about this land's immensity and beauty, but also its unfor unforgivable nature in the journals of Lewis and Clark, Zebulon Pike, Stephen Long, Jebediah Smith, and John Wesley Powell, just to name a few, have served as inspiration to experience these amazing American landscapes firsthand. While these early explore, explorers spoke of these landscapes, the, the splendor of these landscapes, they also wrote of its vastly contrasting climatic uh, conditions compared with that of the eastern United States. The aridity of these landscapes was something that they had never encountered. The expedition parties that carried settlers past the 100th meridian often took place in summer months when travel was most manageable and food sources reliable. However, explorers' schedules quickly became constrained to the availability of water. Um, even as expeditions encountered more dependable, higher mountain stream systems, the varying intensities and the seasonal ephemerality constrained parties to camp and settle in close proximity to these resources. To the degree that people spoke about the magnificent, magnific magnificence of these newly encountered landscapes, some expressed an equal degree of concern when considering them for Western expansion. So these are some early images. Uh, obviously Lewis and Clark and then John Wesley Powell's expeditions down the Green and Colorado River. John Wesley Powell was one who expressed deep concern for Western expansion into these arid lands. Known as a great explorer and meticulous documenter, Powell was tasked by Congress with assessing many of the unknown regions of the Great American Desert, as the name was, as it was given uh, by, the, the, by those who had traveled into this area in years prior. The report of the lands of the arid region of the U.S. in 1878. Um, he was widely known for his ideas um, in organizing settlements around water and watersheds, uh, which would force water users to conserve the scarce resource because overuse or pollution would hurt everyone in the watershed. watershed. He, wanted that, uh, he warned that the cultivation of traditional agricultural, agriculture and urban development familiar and fruitful to uh, the eastern United States was not suitable or sustainable for many of the arid lands that he had encountered. Expeditions led by Powell and others down rivers such as the Green in Colorado exposed just how essential these watersheds were to the surrounding ecology and landscape. So these are some early thoughts about uh, expeditions into, uh, and some later thoughts, um, about just the state of water within these landscapes. Um, this is a map talking about John Wesley's Powell John Wesley Powell's report to Congress um, in the lands of the arid region. Um, and it basically just spoke to this idea of organizing uh, new centers of population around watersheds uh, so that conflict would not arise. Today, um, or I guess, however, Powell's forewarnings were largely uh, ignored as the government passed the Homestead Act, um, which incentivized Western expansion, and as well as the f uh, formation of the Bureau of L Reclamation, which designed the most substantial system of irrigation infrastructure the world has ever seen. Today we awaken each morning to more and more newspaper articles talking about the widespread Western drought, ecological degradation in the, of the natural environment, and the drying of agricultural lands and their irrigation sources. It is hard not to return to Powell's forewarnings about how these lands shouldn't be occupied. 
As my love for the West's natural features, as well as the cities and towns, has grown stronger during my trips, my understanding of water management's importance to their health and longevity has grown similarly. It is one thing to be informed of PAL's forewarnings, visit places of degrading status and say, I told you so. It is another to recognize the same thing and use this higher knowledge to design and plan for a more sustainable future. Overall, this trip was not about scowling over the places, industries, and people that occupy the landscapes that perpetuate some of the issues that are rising today. It was about immersing myself at a cultural level into the lives of the stakeholders, both rural and urban, um, that value these water resources so dearly. It was about identifying problems, cultural misconceptions, and the politics behind the many water-related issues facing the region today. Additionally, the project was about taking inventory of the immense infrastructural networks that allow life in the West to continue and prosper today. So in the nearly four months of my travels, I've had a great opportunity to digest and reflect upon the many incredible experiences and knowledge that I obtained about water-related issues, specifically within the Rio Grande and Colorado River basins. As a striving landscape architect, uh, immersed within a thesis prep course, I've used this time to develop a prelim preliminary design proposal that I will strive to address at the end of this presentation. But first, I want to take you on this journey that followed the Rio Grande River and the Colorado Rivers from Texas and Arizona, respectively, to their headwaters uh, in the San Juan and Rocky Mountains. So the rest of the presentation kind of takes a less formal approach. It's going to be more of just kind of this journey that I've taken. Um, some of the documentation that I, that I took. Um, so I'll begin in the Rio Grande watershed. I'm not gonna mention everything on this route. Um, and then I'll move to the Colorado watershed, but just emphasizing the importance of these places, uh, the, the water to these places, um, supporting massive, amount, massive amounts of populations, growing populations, um, and then extents of agriculture uh, that much of the United States' uh, vegetables, uh, nuts, fruits come from. Colorado River watershed, um, the darker blue. So I'm starting in uh, Big Bend National Park. Um, and I guess I'm gonna speak to the infrastructural, recreational, um, agricultural, and cultural importance of these places as I kind of go through these a little more informally. So in Big Bend, uh, it's t towards the end of the Rio Grande's river uh, towards the end of the river's journey. Um, it borders Mexico, so basically right on the border. I mean, it kind of represents this landscape where the river has been tapped into uh, immensely as it's gone through New Mexico and parts of Texas. Uh, agricultural irrigation plays a huge role in uh, depleting the river of its native flow as it travels through Big Bend. So the water levels in June, which typically should represent some of the higher times of uh, flow, were significantly lower. And then, so starting from this basin from the south to north, uh, I got to experience many of these agricultural uh, taps as I moved north. So pecan farms are a major industry in southern New Mexico. Um, and just attempting to understand these stakeholders and their, the importance uh, of these water bodies to agriculture and to whatever industry that they're engaged within uh, was just kind of my goal and trying to understand the problems um, and, and engage in dialogue with farmers, uh, the people that depend on these, these resources. So as you can see, um, lower levels of the river and uh, drought hasn't really affected much of the plantings of these pecan orchards and other types of agriculture in the region, which was really interesting to see. Um, but then also looking at the cultural importance of these places, um, the acequias are a significant, um, a significant infrastructural irrigation method in this region. So seeing some of these older systems was very interesting. Um, and then moving north into some of the larger reservoirs, but seeing the impacts that droughts and increased demand has had on these, on these places. I was lucky enough to visit a lot of uh, the state parks in New Mexico, which have reinvested in, um, in repairing habitats to try to um, just create a better habitat and, and maintain some of these water resources um, into the future. I was also lucky enough to go on this trip um, with my girlfriend, and we experienced um, 
the recreational amenities that are so important uh, to these places. Uh, whitewater rafting, um, they're massive industries that support economies throughout Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, and, and the states that encompass these watersheds. And then truly seeing the impacts of irrigation um, was something that I've heard about but had never seen firsthand. So the pivot irrigation systems that exist are all over the place. Um, and the contrast between an irrigated field and the one next to it that may be dry was pretty uh, eye-opening. And then finally in the Rio Grande Basin reaching the San Juan Mountains, uh, which would serve as the headwaters um, and an ecological hotbed for many, um, many species. And then switching over to the Colorado watershed, um, which is very close by, similar issues um, have arisen in the past decade, two decades, um, in terms of water rights and its future, the future of industry such as agriculture. Um, but also in this more populated region, its, its conflict between rural and urban is really pronounced. Um, so attempting to understand this cultural conflict, these political conflicts, uh, was something that I sought to do. Uh, this is a farm that I visited that um, is highly reclaimed for its sustainable uh, water use. It's a closed circuit system. They, they reuse water, I think, four to five times on site before it's released to a river, which is very rare for this region. Um, and then obviously, being in the West, you got to experience these amazing landscapes. So just traveling from one place to another, obviously Monument Valley is one of the more memorable times that they got to experience. Um, and then looking at these massive infrastructural projects that make up this landscape and allow for this landscape and the urban fabric around it to exist, um, you hear about these things and to really trace them from one point to another and trying to understand them holistically uh, was a really interesting part of the trip. We got to experience these rivers both from the side of the road and then on the river itself. Um, which was a really amazing experience. And then finally, as we make our way up to the headwaters of the Colorado River, um, talking to groups that are invested in preserving uh, the natural state of these rivers, um, but also working with water companies who have interests in buying lands, agricultural lands in this region, uh, so that they can provide uh, water for cities like Denver um, and this Front Range um, as they grow and double, actually, towards the uh, later half of the century. So we actually got to go out with someone who works for the Colorado Headwaters Land Trust um, as she was just going about her daily tasks of documenting these places, making sure that the easements that people had um, given to this trust were being honored. And then as I end this presentation, um, I'm gonna go into more, a, little, a little bit more of how this trip has inspired my thesis um, moving forward. So, as I mentioned, uh, water companies in Denver and the Front Range have an immense interest in the western slopes of the Colorado uh, Rocky Mountains. And so early in the 20th century, um, immense infrastructural projects to divert water west to east over the Great Divide um, were pursued. And so I started to try to take in the scope and the scale of some of these projects. Uh, this would be Northern Waters Colorado Big Thompson project. Um, and this is actually a tunnel that takes water from the western slopes underneath the Rocky Mountains for 35 miles. Um, this is the, uh, the human opening, the tunnel, obviously you can't see. Um, but just kind of documenting and seeing how that, seeing how northern water advertised or did not advertise these systems to the public, because um, they're, they're incredibly critical to large population center, yet they go fairly unnoticed within the landscape. So this is the project map overall. Um, if you can, the, the yellow line is the Great Divide, uh, the Continental Divide. Um, so water's pumped from west to east into the more populated and agriculturally irrigated areas. So this is Granby and Grand Lake were part of this system. Um, they're artificially created lakes that supply um, and store these water supplies. And as you can see, some of this 
information um, is quite neglected um, and aged quite a bit. And it just posed the question to me is how can, as a landscape architect, how can I expose this invisible set or seemingly invisible set of infrastructure so that public, the public can gain a better appreciation for its significance and their dependency on it? And so to conclude, um, in kind of developing my thesis, I've created um, the, or developed the idea of creating a trail system to raise public awareness pertaining to water-related issues in the region. Um, so the system will connect the complex network of diversion infrastructure in a comprehensible journey that could be experienced sequentially with the flow of water from west to east or incrementally. The trail network will serve as a provoking political and social forum, but also an illumination of the inherent beauty of the natural and built landscapes that it transects. So I guess in a very quick um, way, uh, you've gotten to take a look at my very broad uh, travels to this region, but then kind of understand how they've narrowed as I've synthesized through this material and, uh, and hopefully develop a, a nice thesis for the spring semester. So thank you. Thank you.